Thank you for the introduction, Steffi, and thank you uh, also, Robert. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, yes, about uh, deep learning architectures and about based non-parametrics and how these two things kind of like uh, make sense together. Um, and let me see. And uh, so uh, first, just so probably everybody knows um, what a deep neural network is. Um, and, and I guess also everybody has sort of like um, uh, seen the, the sort of like the improvements in all kinds of uh, performance measures and applications of deep learning in, uh, in like a variety of fields. And it's quite impressive what uh, people have managed to do uh, with um, often very complicated uh, new network architectures. And um, um, so like essential in, in, in all of this or sort of like a crucial part in all of this is that we're usually trying to uh, maximize some, some loss and uh, in deep learning, this is often um, the conditional log likelihood or if you would do generative modeling, then that this might be uh, like the log, the log likelihood function. So we are uh, looking for this W star, which here tries to denote sort of like the, the best um, weight set that we can find for some training data set. Um, uh, however, even though we have all of these uh, sort of like nice um, results of deep learning in practice, we often find that they tend to be overconfident. They tend to be uh, not very robust to uh, adversarial attacks. And it's uh, sort of like inherently very difficult to estimate uncertainties um, of those models. So even though we are maybe able to find some solution for this optimization problem, um, this optimization landscape is unfortunately very non-convex. And so there might be multiple solutions that are all more or less equally good. And uh, we don't really know anything about the uncertainties about uh, sort of like this uh, model that we found. And uh, Bayesian deep learning is basically motivated in some sense um, to, uh, to kind of like uh, solve parts of this problem by instead of uh, uh, using a frequentist approach and trying to find the maximum likelihood estimate, we're trying to use like a, a Bayesian approach. So we are incorporating prior knowledge through some uh, prior distributions. And then we are interested in, in finding the posterior distribution instead of trying to optimize some objective. Um, the nice thing about this is that uh, it's, a, it's a very principled mathematically found uh, framework. And uh, it allows us to estimate uncertainties, do model selection, all kinds of nice things. <clears throat> um, so what I've written here is basically the, uh, the posterior distribution. Um, so in, when we then want to do predictions, what we need to do uh, is we need to uh, compute the predictive posterior distribution. And uh, the predictive posterior distribution uh, is typically formulated like this. And uh, um, you can already see sort of like there are two big problems with that. Um, the first problem is that in order to compute the exact posterior distribution, we need to compute the integral. And this integral is over the space of uh, the parameters. Uh, luckily, we can ignore this because it's a, it's a fixed uh, normalization constant. Um, but if we want to do uh, predictions, we again have to integrate over the space of all possible parameters. And uh, here we can't really uh, remove this integral, so we have to approximate it in some form. So in practice, uh, even though this is a nice theoretic framework, we have to use approximations to actually be able to work with that. And somehow my now, oh, okay. And uh, so a short outline of uh, what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about three things uh, more or less. Uh, the first one is kind of like the question of how can we encode some sensible prior knowledge into all of this if we have this machinery and we have some nice tools for, for approximate inference. And uh, one way to do that, uh, what I'm gonna talk about is basically uh, by looking at the connection to Gaussian processes and that allows us to understand um, sort of what the behavior of those uh, priors uh, induce if we choose them in a specific way. And uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about probabilistic circuits. So before uh, I moved to Alto, I did my P 
PhD on probabilistic circuits, so I'm very <laughs> fond of those models. And what could see them as uh, like a very structured form of neural network. And there, the question would arise whether there's also some connection to Gaussian processes. And we can do something similar to what I'm going to talk about in the first section. And it turns out it's not quite like this, but there is a connection to some other stochastic process, which is called the Fourier tree process. And that allows us also again to, to characterize the, the behavior. Um, and at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about applications. I'm going to show two, uh, two applications that uh, we worked on um, that basically uh, try to use these, uh, these Bayesian deep learning tools in, in some practical computer vision tasks. Okay, um, so first I'm going to talk about encoding conservative behavior into Bayesian neural networks. So I said at the beginning, one, one issue is often that uh, neural networks uh, tend to be overconfident. So if we look at this picture here, this is uh, the, <coughs> Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the result of a Bayesian neural network that uses ReLU activation functions. So this is kind of like the, uh, the standard activation function used in, in the literature. And what we see is that when we sort of leave, uh, can, ah, here's a little point. Okay. So once we leave the state regime here, uh, we tend to have very confident predictions that everything in this area is uh, associated to the blue class, even though it might not be the case. So uh, by, what we might want to have is something that is a little bit more conservative in its predictions. So some model that uh, instead of saying, okay, everything that is like in this direction is going to be blue, uh, is going to say, oh, I'm not certain about the prediction anymore. So I'm kind of like returning to some default uh, and high uncertainty value. And uh, the type of models that uh, have this behavior are actually uh, stationary Gaussian processes and they're uh, widely used uh, in signal processing. And uh, so the question arises whether we can sort of uh, draw some connection between stationary Gaussian processes and neural networks to, to get this behavior. And the way to, uh, that we did this is by looking at the infinite width of uh, Bayesian neural networks. So there's some, some well-studied connection to Gaussian process priors. And uh, this dates back to the 90s where Redford Neal uh, looked into uh, these things in his PhD thesis and has been studied a lot in uh, uh, all kinds of uh, ways uh, later on. And, uh, and one interesting aspect of this is that we can characterize the induced functional prior by looking at the covariance function of the network once the, the sort of like the, the number of hidden units goes to infinity. So this uh, in this limit where K goes to infinity. And then uh, we can write the fun a covariance function in such a form. And uh, one thing that we uh, see is that, uh, so this, the solution to this integral is basically characterized by what is the prior on the weights and the prior on the, the bias terms here, and what is the uh, activation function. So sigma here denotes this uh, activation function, which usually is like a ReLU activation function. <clears throat> so we were interested in figuring out whether we can man manipulate this in some way that we get something uh, where we can guarantee that it's going to be a stationary process. And uh, the way we do this is by um, yet looking at another uh, connection and that is the connection between uh, the covariance of a stationary process and uh, their spectral density decomposition. So there's some uh, duality be between covariance function and spectral density function. And uh, so this, what is noted here with kappa, is the covariance function of a stationary process. So before it was a function of x and x prime, but because a stationary process only <coughs> depends on the difference between x and x prime, so it's a process that uh, where the prior is translation invariant. Um, so we can replace this two arguments by one argument, so R. R is here just a sort of the difference or the norm of the difference. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we can write this covariance function in terms of uh, spectral density. So this S here is called the spectral density if, if it exists and, and, uh, and the rest looks a bit nasty, but uh, ends up being uh, not too bad. And uh, now the question is, can we kind of recover this, uh, this form um, for a Bayesian neural network. 
and how can we cover that? And it turns out, if you are like familiar with signal processing, it's maybe not too surprising that uh, periodic activation functions uh, do exactly that. So uh, if you use a, a sign activation function or some other types of periodic activation functions, so those are the, the ones that we looked at uh, in the paper, then all of those will introduce this conservative behavior in your network. Um, so, and the interesting bit to me is that this sort of like is not just for like a typical sign activation function, but also for some rather sort of like weird activation functions. So we looked at triangle waves, maybe not too weird, but then we also looked at like a construction that is essentially like a ReLU activation function, but periodic. So the important part is basically that it has uh, periodicity and uh, you can uh, approximate it with the Fourier series. And this is uh, uh, one slide with math that I'm just uh, going to skip mostly, but uh, just to convince you that uh, for this example where the activation function is uh, a sign activation function scale with some constant and the, the, the probability distribution on the bias is a uniform distribution. And if we do calculations that are not so hard to do, we end up with something that looks like this at the bottom. And now if we choose this prior on the weights to be a symmetric prior, then this collapses back to this uh, Wiener-Kinchian theorem form. And uh, we can kind of uh, consume all of these uh, complicated terms that were in front of the integral into the prior distribution. And then we can figure out what should this prior distribution be and what is kind of like the behavior that we get. And the nice thing is that uh, this works really nicely for um, a large class of, um, um, of um, priors. And uh, specifically, we looked at the, uh, the there's a family of uh, functional priors that is called the Matan class uh, in the Gaussian processes. And uh, it turns out that if you look at their spectral density, so you can open the book on Gaussian processes, look what is the spectral density, and then it turns out this is a uh, so-called student T distribution. And this exactly corresponds basically to this prior distribution in our derivations at the end. Uh, so we have a direct correspondence of the prior on the weights to the spectral density function of those uh, sort of like uh, limiting processes. And we can also do simulations to verify that this is the case. So this is what we did here. So there are uh, special, uh, two special cases of this Matan class. One is called an exponential kernel. And the other one is the RBF kernel, um, which corresponds to using a Cauchy distribution or a Gaussian distribution. And no matter what activation function we use, we, we always get sort of like something that looks very close to the exact result. So it seems to, seems to work quite well uh, in terms of the theory, at least. And uh, this um, then also in praxis uh, ends up working uh, quite well. Uh, the animation here is a bit broken, unfortunately. But um, so the top picture shows you an example where we train the, uh, the, the network. So we have a um, conversion on your network. And then with this uh, activation function at the last hint layer, and we swap this activation function to be either a relu or a sine or sine cosine and so on and so forth. And uh, we train the model on MNIST digits, and then we evaluate it on MNIST digits that are rotated. So we are rotating them by like at the end, 360 degrees, so uh, one time around. And uh, what you would expect is that uh, once you start rotating them, your model should be more and more sort of uncertain about those images because it hasn't seen those rotated images in the training. And once they are sort of like rotated by 180 degrees, right, then you have numbers like eight and zero that are basically uh, symmetric. So they look just the same, so your confidence should increase, and then it goes down again. And, and uh, if you're at 360, then it's, uh, you, you've made a whole circle. And uh, so what you see here is the blue line is the ReLU network. So this tends to be like reasonably confident all over, uh, while those other, um, those other sort of activation functions introduce a more conservative behavior. So you're less confident about your prediction, which is kind of what you want. And the negative log predictive density, which is shown here, uh, is basically a similar measure and tells you kind of like more or less the same story. 
And then we evaluated this also on uh, some larger data sets. So we trained the model on Cypher 10 and then looked at uh, Cypher 10 and Cypher 100 and SVHN, uh, SVHN images. And uh, SVHN is very different to the data that the model was trained on. And Cypher 100 is a little bit out of domain. So it doesn't contain the same classes of images, but it's sort of uh, uh, originates from the same sort of uh, data acquisition. So the, the pictures are somewhat similar. And what you see is that if you look at the marginal variances that uh, the, the ReLU network is not able to distinguish between uh, images that are actually from a very different data domain. Um, so it, it is, has a low variance, even though this SVHN data is like very different. Why if you use a periodic activation function, you, you get a very high marginal variance for those kind of data points. And for data that is sort of similar, but different, you, you get a wide, wider spread for the variance. So that's also quite, quite nice, I think. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna kind of like make a small jump and uh, go towards function price on Bayesian probabilistic circuit. So all of this is kind of like nice and raises the question whether um, that is applicable to also more complicated networks. So new networks that have a little bit more structure than just a normal new network multilayer perceptron that has sort of like an infinitely wide hidden uh, layer. And this is a kind of like an ongoing project and that I'm working on with uh, some colleagues in, in Vancouver, where we look at uh, probabilistic circuits and um, in order to figure out what happens if you take them to some limit. And uh, if you take the, the depth to be infinite, it turns out that they have some correspondence to poetry processes in, in some cases. Uh, so before I, I continue with this uh, very short uh, kind of like introduction with to poetry processes, because I'm not expecting that uh, many people are familiar with this. So the, the poetry process is uh, also a, a Bayesian non-parametric prior, um, but why the Gaussian process is a process over functions, a prior over functions, this process is a prior over uh, probability functions. So over functions that integrate one. So very, very sort of like very special functions in a way. And uh, what is interesting about this poetry process is that it can generate um, probability distributions that are discrete or continuous. So we can either get probability distributions discrete or that are continuous. Um, so most processes either only can generate continuous distributions or only discrete distributions. And uh, the other interesting thing is that poetry processes have a closed form solution of their posterior because of the, the way they are constructed. And they are an instance of a slightly larger family. Uh, and they are quite an old model. And here's a uh, illustration of a poetry process from the 70s um, where people actively studied uh, or started studying these kind of space of probability measures. Um, and uh, what those processes essentially do is that they take the sample space and then they recursively partition that sample space into subparts. So here the sample space would be sort of like the bounded space between zero and one. And then you're recursively splitting this up always in the middle in this case into subparts. And then you associate every branch in this tree, in this partition tree with some conditional probability Y or Y zero here. And uh, this condition probability is uh, generated according to a beta distribution in case of a Poyagic process. <clears throat> okay, um, and uh, probabilistic circuits are sort of uh, uh, kind of a very special type of uh, new network, one could say, um, where this computational graph that we have in new networks uh, consists only of some um, product nodes and has at the input uh, input nodes, which are usually uh, nonlinear and represent some probability distributions. So here's some some illustration of a of a probabilistic circuit. And uh, um, while neural networks represent arbitrary functions, probabilistic circuits um, usually always represent uh, distribution functions or like densities or 
including in this in this range. So that means when I'm actually evaluating this model, uh, what I get out at the end is always a probability value, right? In, in, in networks, I would get a prediction, and in these models, I get a probability. So um, uh, one special property, uh, so they, they, those probabilistic circuits have been introduced in order to study their structural properties. And then one special property um, uh, is called deep determinism. And uh, that's a very strong constraint. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to explain in detail now what this is, um, but and just that you know, so like there exists this, this constraint is quite strong on the structure of the network. Um, it has some sort of like special role in the way that it uh, renders many probabilistic queries tractable, like uh, maximum a posteriori inference and, and those kind of things. And uh, it turns out that for these uh, type of uh, circuits that are deterministic, we can actually uh, uh, write a constructive proof that uh, if we treat them in a Bayesian way, that those are related to truncated Fourier tree processes. So that means in the infinite limits, those processes essentially are um, equivalent to a Fourier tree process. And this is quite nice because it allows us to uh, study the, the, the prior on distribution that those, those models are actually sort of representing. And it turns out that there is like, uh, like an interesting fact I find is that uh, in the literature on, on probabilistic circuits, we, we usually generate the parameters uh, according to some the let distribution or uh, beta distribution. Um, and we, we do this in a very naive way, which is that we usually use like a uniform hyperparameter. So all of these values are the same and they're all set to one or something like that. And it turns out if we look at the literature on Puya trees and we think about this uh, sort of a like connection, then it turns out that for Puya trees, if you would do the same, then we're actually generating uh, singular measures. So we, we generate probability distributions like a, v, uh, like a Virac data or like a Cantor distribution or something like this. So, so very uh, odd things that we actually don't really want. Um, so all of this, what people have been doing is it's sort of like impossible, but actually generates really strange results. And that has also been observed in some extent in the literature by people um, that you have to sort of tweak those parameters and it doesn't really work so well. And uh, it turns out um, there are much better choices for doing those and they tend to be uh, dependent on the depth. So either it scales sort of like, uh, so that it uh, this alpha parameter decreases or this alpha parameter increases has then uh, different uh, implications and we either generate discrete distributions or we generate the distributions that have a density. So, and another uh, nice thing that uh, we are looking at is that uh, you can use this connection to actually also scale Poirier trees by uh, representing their truncated versions as a uh, probabilistic circuit. And that can substantially reduce the costs. So I'm not going to talk too much about this, but the fact is basically that um, Poirier trees scale quite badly with the dimensionality because they suffer from this curse of dimensionality. And we could so, sort of circumvent this curve, curse of dimensionality to some extent by constructing them using probabilistic circuits. And there are many open questions that we're currently looking at like the truncation errors or representation or errors if we use a probabilistic circuit and also what is basically uh, the limiting process of non-deterministic circuit. And it's probably something about mixtures of Poirier trees but it's not quite clear yet. Uh, and then another question would be sort of like leaving this realm of probabilistic circuit, like in more general, I think it's quite interesting to think about more structured neural network architectures because this is at the end what people use uh, like capsule networks and transformers and, and uh, whatever. And usually these assumptions that are made by um, people when they look at uh, some asymptotics uh, of neural networks, they are often very simple and, uh, and not really characterize the types of models that we use. So now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about these uh, applications that uh, I've been involved with. Um, that are in this realm of applying um, Bayesian, Bayesian deep learning in the context of computer vision. And the first one 
is called uh, uncertainty guided source free domain adaptation is um, basically uh, an idea to use this Bayesian approach to to robustify domain adaptation. And uh, in the second, uh, I'm going to talk about very complicated new network architectures with a co which are called dynamic new networks and how a Bayesian approach can help to sort of improve the decision making in those kind of models. So source-free domain adaptation is um, um, a setting where you have a model that you train on some source data. <clears throat> and uh, this, uh, this model that is trained on the source data is then applied on some target data. And on this target data, you usually don't have any labels. So it's an unlabeled data set, for example, in this case of, of images. Those, and you assume that this distribution of images is sort of similar to the distribution that you have seen in the source training, but not quite the same. And now you're trying to adapt the model to those uh, those target data, but in this setup, you don't have access to the source uh, to the source data anymore. So this is why it's called source-free domain adaptation. So you're doing the domain adaptation without accessing the source data. You only have access to the to the model that you have trained in the source data. So it's a very by itself a very difficult task, and uh, what we did is basically introducing this green block in the middle here, um, which in addition in the source training phase um, uh, uses a Laplace approximation to approximate the posterior distribution on the source data. And then we modified this adaptation phase on the training data to incorporate this uncertainty that we get through the uh, Laplace approximation. And uh, this has some nice um, benefits so we can steer basically this adaptation phase a little bit through those uncertainties and uh, th those are some this is some uh, a study that we did where we looked at domain shift and if you look at the strong domain shift then what you see here is um, basically uh, the model trained on the source data so this is like this uncertainty guided model which has uh, a Laplace approximation built in and this would be kind of like the vanilla model, the, the standard neural network. And then if you observe now some target data, so the coloring of those, uh, you don't know, right? You only have those, those position of those dots, but you don't know whether they are green, red, or blue. And uh, you perform the adaptation phase. Then uh, what happens is that in this case for the sort of like normal model, it kind of like flips uh, the decision boundary. So now everything that's supposed to be red is, is now going to be green and so on and so forth. Why in this case, so in our case, we can incorporate this uh, uncertainties over the predictions that the model has, and then we are still able to recover the correct decision boundary. So this is of course a bit toyish here, um, uh, but in in practice, we then evaluated on like a large uh, set of different uh, domain adaptation tasks, and it uh, is so that in average, this also seems to kind of like improve the results. And uh, and the second thing um, um, we worked on, which is uh, something that's currently under review, um, is uh, about dynamic neural networks. So dynamic neural networks are very uh, fancy and complicated uh, architectures, uh, which essentially are built around the idea that you want to um, be resource efficient. So you assume that the the cost for inference so for doing predictions is very high for example you are de developing a network or a model that is then developed uh, <coughs> sorry is then deployed in, in 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 some web service or something like this where you have a lot of queries all the time and uh, you want to reduce the the cost by exiting the network uh, earlier if the the test sample is very easy to, to classify so in this case, uh, you have basically a network that has a cascade built in. Uh, so meaning your, your image here will be going through the first block and then you get some prediction and some uh, confidence for the prediction. And you're making then the decision whether you're going to exit the network and believe that this prediction is correct or whether you're going to continue to the next block and then pay the price because it's more expensive to do and hopefully get a better prediction. So like it's a decision-making process, a problem when, when it's sort of like best to exit uh, this computation. 
Um, and interestingly, nobody really looked at uh, uh, model and uh, epistemic uncertainties in, in this kind of setup. Um, and uh, so um, um, we decided we are going to do this. And uh, in this illustration here, you see uh, the uncertainty versus uh, the, the sort of, like, I think the, the error that you're making on the y-axis um, for the last two blocks on a model that is trained on Cypher 100 uh, for the test samples here illustrated. And what you can see is that, uh, so like this, it's a bit difficult to see. This is kind of like the histogram over um, incorrect predictions for the normal model. And this is the histogram for predictions over the, the model that incorporates uncertainties. And what you can see is basically that this vanilla model is very overconfident. So like when it's very much to the left and we are very certain that uh, those wrong predictions are sort of like should be correct. So we, we are sort of like uh, like uh, very confidently making wrong predictions. Like this. Um, so that, so by simply incorporating some Bayesian priors, you end up uh, sort of like with a model that ends up being less overconfident, and uh, it has some nice uh, properties. One of them is that uh, you in increase performance and measured in terms of accuracy. This is kind of like what computer vision papers care about. But uh, the other things that are also nice that uh, surprisingly also nobody in the, in the computer vision domain seems to sort of look at so much is that um, you can actually measure that your model is going to be less overconfident in terms of the negative or predictive density. So uh, the, the lower, the better in this case. You can also verify that the calibration error is much smaller if you do that. So the black line is always kind of like uh, our model and the orange line is the same model, but without uh, using any kind of like Bayesian priors. And if you look at top five accuracy, then you get actually quite a quite a good improvement in terms of performance. And so this is also those are also results on on Cypher one hundred. All right, um, and with this, I'm I'm going to conclude. So uh, maybe some take home message is kind of that. Uh, I believe that this connection between neural networks and and their limiting behavior uh, is quite um, interesting and can help us understand the inductive bias, uh, uh, inductive bias uh, of uh, a new network, and can help us uh, construct uh, models have more desirable behaviors. And uh, maybe uh, in it, uh, one sort of uh, interesting insight for me was that activation functions actually encode very strong modeling assumptions. And uh, it, it's maybe a bit uh, sort of like um, um, too little of a kind of like a known fact that by choosing a relative activation function, you're also choosing sort of like the behavior of your neural network. It's not only for optimization. And that uh, priors basically matter also in Bayesian probabilistic circles. We've seen that that choosing the hyperparameters of the, of the price has a very strong effect on what you can actually learn with those models. And, uh, and uh, that in general, Bayesian deep learning, even though it's very difficult to do in practice, but now luckily there are good tools for doing approximate inference uh, can help in improving and robustifying decision making in downstream applications. All right, and uh, thank you for listening.